I want to tackle a subject <laughs> called the first and the greatest commandment. We're going to try and uh, make it clear. The first and the greatest commandment. Matthew 22 verse 37. You, tells who is to, you, shall love the Lord your God, tells you who you're supposed to love and who is supposed to love God. Okay? Then it tells us how we're to love Him. With all of our heart, that's the mind, the emotion, and the will. With all our soul, here the soul is the spirit. My soul doth magnify the Lord. 120 souls were in the upper room. So can be a person, so can be the spirit in the Bible. Here it's the spirit. And with all your mind, with all your understanding. And as you know, <clears throat> understanding is imperative. Uh, if you don't understand proper hygiene, you can get diseases. You can get sick when it's preventable. And so understanding... You see, you got to have understanding to drive a car or fly an airplane. And so God says, it's obvious to love me, you got to have understanding. You got to do it by understanding. All right, not just your spirit. And most Christians, from my experience, are too lazy to dig into the Word and get understanding. <laughs> That's work. We just think we go to church and through osmosis, pow, we know everything. And so, we are to love God with our understanding, with our spirit, and with our heart, mind, and emotions. Then Jesus says, this is the what? Great commandment. The major commandment. How do you know there's a difference between the minor league baseball and major league baseball? Which one is the top one? Yeah, yeah. Minor, you're, you're trying to work your way up. All right? And that's a lot of Christians. They're trying to work their way up. They're hung up on second coming doctrines and all kinds of things. And uh, you need to get into the major leagues. Loving God is the major leagues. And it is the what? First commandment. The first in rank. Top commandment. Alright? That's Matthew 22 said by the Lord Jesus Christ. Now Romans 13.10 tells us to love our neighbor is to do no harm to the neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfillment of the law. And so loving God would be what? Doing nothing to harm God. Not speaking evil of God. Not harming God. Is that logical? Is that Bible? Yeah. All right. And remember, this is the major, the first commandment. Now, in the past 50 years, I have noticed that the success of the American church has been increasingly measured by the second commandment. And what is the second commandment? Love your neighbor as you love yourself. If you are helping the poor, if you are dealing with the homeless, the addicts, the alcoholics, the prostitutes. You are a great church. Now in the 50s it wasn't like that. The church has been on a decline for quite a few decades. I lived through this time and I saw it. I experienced it. I lived in it. And we measure your Christianity by how you treat the down and outer. Right? Some churches even treat faith as the first commandment. Some, the Holy Spirit baptism. You'd think that's the only commandment in the Bible. Be filled with the Holy Ghost, speak in tongues. And I speak in tongues. I've been filled with the Holy Ghost. So I have a right to talk about Holy Ghost filled people. <laughs> All right? Uh, or worship. Oh man, if... if if I can go to church and rock out, or country out, or whatever, uh, church is nothing more than a music concert. That is their priority. That is their first commandment. 
and God's first commandment takes a secondary position to it. In the USA Today this week, a prominent person, politician, said, Faith is the principles by which a person chooses to live by. Didn't say faith in the Bible and Jesus. Didn't say faith in truth and right. Just said it is. And this is how people interpret faith in your generation. It's whatever you believe. You're persuaded is okay. It's okay. All right. And so when you have your faith, that's why when people say, my faith, you've, you've heard that statement? Politicians are always saying it, my faith, my faith. <clears throat> and uh, renowned people like actors and sports heroes and so forth, my faith, my faith. Well, when you've got your faith, your faith can change and your faith can be wrong. Now, I am the Lord thy God, I change not. I change not. Again, I am the same yesterday, today, and forever. Does God change his standards of conduct, conduct and behavior? No. no, they've always been the same. But see, when you got your faith, you can change it any time you want. When you have faith in the Bible, it's truth and it's righteousness and in Jesus Christ, it is unchangeable. Hallelujah. And so that's why... We've been in a decline in the church in America. Only 20% of Americans go to church now. When I did a survey back 10 or 20 years ago, 27% went. All right? We don't see the significance of even coming together anymore. <clears throat> see, when you get your eyes off the first commandment, you can deviate into areas that you wouldn't even think and, and probably don't even know you're, you, you detoured in. Now, how is God to be loved then? How do I love God? That's the next question. If, if he is the first and great commandment, then how do I love him? Well, one of several scriptural illustrations of a Christian relationship with God is marriage. In Isaiah 54, 5, your maker is your husband. The Lord of hosts is his name. Who is the Lord of hosts? Jesus. <laughs> Who is our maker? God with Jesus. Alright. Let us make man in our image. Plural, plural. Okay, you got it? Alright. So, we're in a husband-wife relationship with God. Alright. Now, we've got to remember that God hid truths in natural parables. In Matthew 13, 34, a parable is a natural illustration of a spiritual truth like the parable of the sower and so forth. Without a parable, Matthew 13, 34, Jesus spoke not to the people. Fulfilling the prophet in Psalm 78, 2, saying, I will open my mouth in parables. I will utter things kept secret from the foundation of the world. You see, how were they kept secret? They were hidden in parables. All right? And when we get understand how to uh, understand the parable, we get understanding of spiritual things. And only the Spirit can do that. Only the Spirit can open up things to you. Because it is a spiritual book. Now, in Romans 16, 25, Paul says, Now to him. Who's him? Jesus. How do we know that? The preaching of Jesus Christ. Who did he preach? Jesus Christ. And who's him? Jesus. Now, and hardly anybody uses this scripture, but it's very powerful. Watch what he's saying. Watch what Paul, the apostle, is saying. Jesus is able to establish you, make you permanently strong in a specific direction. He is able to make you what? Permanently, not wishy-washy, not up and down, strong. And in what direction is he going to make you strong? Truth and righteousness. 
Isn't that right? And he's going to make you what? Permanently. You're not going to be some flake. Yo-yo up and down in God. Jesus has the power to make you permanently moving in a direction of righteousness and truth. Amen. Isn't that powerful? And hardly anybody uses that. They use God so loved the world he gave his only begotten son. You know, I'm not saved by grace through faith. And I, and I. But this is a powerful statement about Jesus Christ. And he goes on to say, according to my gospel. Well, when I see my gospel, I don't care about Paul's gospel. But he explains what his gospel is. The preaching of Jesus Christ. Well, that's all right then. If that's his gospel, the preaching of Jesus, I can accept that. Amen? And he doesn't stop there. His gospel is not just preaching of Jesus Christ, but also according to the revelation of the mystery, the parables, kept secret since the world began, but now made plain, made clear by the prophetic scriptures. Now he's talking about Jeremiah, Isaiah, the psalm, Micah, all the scriptures, prophetic is his gospel. Now I can handle that. Hallelujah. I don't want to hear Paul's opinion. I want to hear God's opinion. All right. And so, he says, these prophetic scriptures is made known to the local church. No? To the power church ministers, the prison ministries, the jail ministries, the street ministries. No. This is revealed to what? All nations. Another word for nations is people. All people. This gospel is supposed to go to the nation. It's supposed to transform a person, a people, a nation, and a world. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And when we get enclosed and only get happy because we're Christians, we're saying we're waiting for the rapture, we are missing the prophetic purposes of God. Right. Hallelujah. Now, parables. Scriptures say in a marriage, the human husband are the leader of the wife and the wives are to obey and follow. Okay? <clears throat> Remember, we have a marriage relationship with God. So here we go. He's going to tell us how a marriage between a human man and a woman is supposed to be. Okay? Ephesians 5.22. Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands. You'll notice it says submit yourselves. It isn't the job of the, of the husband to go, Submit, woman! The woman has to make a decision to work with that man. That's right. Amen. All right? As she's got to make a decision as unto who? Lord. The Lord. We've got to submit to the Lord. We've got to submit to our husband in the natural. We've got to admit, submit to our Lord Jesus, our husband in the spiritual. Amen? Amen? Now, the husband also has a responsibility to love his wife as Christ loved the church. And gave himself for it. And nurtured her and... and uh, Cherished as her, you see. And honestly, most marriages do not live up to this scripture. Because the man don't follow Christ like he should. And then he wants the woman to follow when she ain't got nothing to follow. That's right. That's right. <laughs> and the woman just wants to do her own thing. I'm, I've got liberty. I'm a, I, you know, I got a right to do what I want to do or whatever. Very few marriages line up to this. But in God, it's different. You can't find a flaw in the God, our husband. Isn't that right? Now, <clears throat> he goes on to say that marriage is a parable of Christ in the church. Remember? He didn't speak to them except in parables. Marriage in Ephesians... Chapter 5 is a parable. And he plainly tells us it's a parable. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. When he got through talking how the human marriage worked, he said, this is a parable. A hidden truth concerning Christ and his church. 
how we are to handle Christ married to us. We are to submit to Him. Amen? Not to our church. I heard somebody say on TV a few months ago, I became a Catholic convert. I converted to Catholicism. That is not in the Bible. You convert from sin to righteousness. You don't get baptized in a church. You get baptized in Christ. <laughs> See, I don't switch from Baptist to a uh, assembly of God or whatever. And I get baptized again. Jesus only died one time. You get baptized one time. And if you want to go from one church to the other, you don't get converted to that church. You at the beginning were converted from sin to right. From error to truth. Amen. That's your conversion. Amen. Isn't that true? That's very true. Hallelujah. Now, <clears throat> you notice that rope up there. And I had an arrow pointing to it. <clears throat> leadership is, is like rope leadership, okay? Let me uh, get this out here. Now, I can push this rope. And all it does is what? Bunch up. It doesn't affect the end of it at all. Okay? I can push this rope up. And what happens? It goes down. But, if I pull this rope, lead it, it follows me wherever I go. See, it's called rope leadership. If you lead, those who are supposed to follow will follow. You got it, church? Amen. You push people, the Bible says a harsh word stirs up breath. You try to push your wife or push your husband, they're just going to harden themselves. You lead them. You lead them by following truth and right. Then you got a chance of them submitting to truth and right. If I go up, this rope goes up with me. Say, rope leadership. And I hear an amen. Amen. Yeah. Now, in Titus chapter 2 verse 5, talking about wives again, he says, for wives to be obedient to their own husband, not someone else's, not men, women are not under the authority of another man. People who mistranslate that don't understand the word man there means husband. A woman never has to obey another man. And we don't have to obey another religion. Pure religion and undefined before God is in the Bible. We follow his religion. Amen? <clears throat> that the word of God may not be blasphemed. So in a Christian marriage, if my home is not in order and my marriage relationship is not in order it can cause people to speak evil of the Word of God come on Jesus made superior promises and when we they see us living like them they go what good is their God amen is the Christian marriage today a mess in America? Oh, yes. Yeah. Because we don't understand. We're waiting for the rapture. Man, we get rock concerts. Oh, yeah. We get dramas and mimes and all kinds of stuff. Hallelujah. But we haven't been focusing on the number one commandment to love God. And so the church is being evil spoken of. Now, if that's true in the natural marriage, it will be true in the spiritual marriage between us and God. Remember Paul said, follow me as I follow Christ? See, he wasn't pushing anybody to follow Christ. He said, here's the message. Repent from sin. 
God will forgive you. You'll have eternal life. And if you don't want it, I'm going to the next town. Isn't that what he did? Yeah. He didn't sit there harping and banging and, and having uh, special promotions, an elephant. We're going to have an elephant out here next week. Boy, invite all your friends. Now he just told the people to repent. <laughs> Are you out there, church? Amen. Good leaders, a famous statement, were once good followers. Okay? Like many natural marriages, many Christians want no responsibility to obey and follow their spiritual husband, God, or Jesus. Okay? Now, in Isaiah chapter 4 verse 1, we find a parable. A parable. In that day, seven women shall take hold of one man, saying, Okay, seven women will take hold of one man and they got something to say. Now, how do we know that's a parable? Because it starts out with <clears throat> in that day. What day? Well, if you read Isaiah, you know Isaiah is talking mostly about the day of the Lord. In Isaiah 2.12, he starts out talking about the day of the Lord. The whole book is about the day of the Lord. Okay? And he's going to explain that the day of the Lord is the first and second coming of Jesus Christ. Isaiah 2.12, the day of the Lord of hosts shall be upon all that are proud and lofty. The Lord alone shall be exalted in that day. They'll go into the rocks and the caves for fear of the Lord when he arises to shake terribly the earth. That's the second coming. The first time he didn't come to judge the world. He come to save the world. The second time he's coming to judge the world. In Isaiah 13, 9, the day of the Lord comes. The stars of the heaven and the moon and the sun will not give their light. And I will punish the world for their evil. Jesus spoke this when he was on earth in Matthew 24 and in Luke and, and in Mark and in the book of Revelations it says they're going to hide from the one that's coming they hide in the caves and in the rocks it's spoken again in the New Testament that's the end of the time that's the end when Christ is coming to hold the world accountable for ignoring him and disobeying him but also Isaiah 13.9, I mean, uh, Isaiah 7.14, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son. Who's that? Yeah, we got it in Matthew chapter 1 and 2. A virgin conceived and bore a son. They called him Jesus. And you shall name, call his name Emmanuel. Okay, then it goes on to say, in that day. What day? The day of the Lord. He's talking about the day of the Lord. So the day of the Lord is when his first coming to his second coming. And all the events in between. Hallelujah. And he shall call his name Emmanuel. For people that do not believe Jesus is God, you have to throw out Emmanuel out of your Bible. Because the Bible says Emmanuel means, means what? God with us. Jesus was God in the flesh. <laughs> Jesus even said he was God. You got it, church? And I ain't got time to get into the Trinity and stuff right now, but you, know, you just got to believe what the Bible says. Jesus is at the right hand of the Father. God in the flesh is at the right hand of God up in heaven. Amen. You say, well, how can that be? He's God. <laughs> He's not limited by natural limitations. Right. Amen? Amen? The Bible says he seated at the right hand of the Father before he ever was seated at the right hand of the Father. Okay? <clears throat> and then he goes on to say in that day. In Isaiah 9, 6, Unto us a child is born, a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulders, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. And of the increase of his government and peace there shall be no end. 
you need to memorize this right here. Amen. Because when we go through dry seasons or dead seasons or apostate seasons, you got to remember God has a goal in every season to increase His government and His peace. Amen? Amen? Amen. You can't just give up and go, oh well, this is a season to hide. And no. No. Hallelujah. They've tried to kill Christianity for 2,000 years and haven't done, succeeded yet. Right. Why? Because of that scripture right there. Yeah. Not because we're goody two-shoe Christians. <laughs> <laughs> Hallelujah. Isn't that powerful? That's yeah. Yeah. So, in that day, seven women will take hold of one man saying, well, the one man is Jesus, of course, right? The day of the Lord. In John 14, 6, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to God the Father but by me. Joseph Smith can't get you there. Muhammad cannot get you there. Mary Baker Eddy cannot get you there. No Protestant pastor can get you there. No leader of any denomination can get you there. The only person that can get you to God the Father is Jesus Christ. He is the only way. Amen. Amen. There is no nonsense that all roads lead to the same God. Jesus leads to God and only He does. If you're going to believe true scripture. If you're going to get away from your faith to His faith, you're going to believe Him. Can I hear an amen? amen. Hallelujah. So, in that day, seven women. Seven women. Seven women. Why seven women? Well, it just happens to be seven churches are listed in the book of Revelation. Just accidentally, I guess, you know, just, just accident. And every one of those churches had a different condition. And so the churches are coming. They, they, they want to take hold of this man, Jesus, okay? But they got something to say about this matter. All right? We'll eat our own food and we'll wear our own apparel. Own food. On apparel. Me, myself, and I. Now, of course, you already know what this means. It's a parable. Food is the word of God. Jesus said, I'll feed you with the finest of the wheat. Wheat is ground up into bread. Bread is food. Wheat is made into cakes. Cakes is food. Desire the sincere milk of the word that you may grow thereby. Milk is what? Food. I can't feed you with milk anymore. You have need of I mean, with meat anymore, you have need of milk. Righteousness is the milk of the word, Hebrews tells us. Meat is food. So, they don't want his word of truth. They want to follow their own truth. Okay? I want you, Jesus, but I'll decide what's truth. And we will wear our own apparel. In Revelations, what does it say? The revelation of the church, a bride adorned for her husband, clothed in white linen, which is the righteousness of the saints. We'll decide what's right. We will decide ourselves what's right. We will decide ourselves what's truth. We just want you. Now, in a normal marriage, there ain't no woman going to go into a marriage having to clothe herself, feed herself, get her own medicine and everything else. Buck up, boy. <laughs> and so we know this is a what? Parable. Are we in that day? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Definitely. Absolutely. Yeah. Jeez. What's the rest of you? <laughs> Only let us be called by your name. How many know what the word Christian means? The suffix at the end tells you. Like Christ or follower of Christ. Ephesian is from a Ephesus. A follower of Ephesus. Christians is a follower of Christ or like Christ or from Christ. 
All right, they want his name. Why do they want his name? They don't want his truth. They don't want his righteousness. They just want his name. Mark 2.10. The Son of Man has power on earth to forgive sin. That's all they're interested in. They don't want to repent. They don't want to stop sinning. They just want to be forgiven and go to heaven. That's all. Are you with me? All right. In John 10, 28, I give them eternal life. No hell. Eternal life? No hell. We're all in eternal life, by the way. It's just you're going to live it in the lake of fire or you're going to live it in heaven. All right. They don't want to go to hell. They don't want to go to the lake of fire. <clears throat> they don't want to be accountable for their sins. They want him to forgive their sin. So if they say, I believe in Christ, I am a Christian, everything is okay. But don't tell me what to do. Don't tell me what to believe. We want to be called by your name to take away our reproach, our shame. Okay? Proverbs 14.34 Righteousness exalts a nation. But sin is a what? Reproach. reproach to any people. You see, they want their sin taken away without having to obey his truth and obey his standard of righteousness. They just want the name. I'm a Christian. I believe in Jesus. <laughs> Are you there, church? Amen. And see, the first and great commandment is to what? Love God. Not yourself. Love Him. What does He want you to do? We're to submit to Him. What does He want me to do? How does He want me to speak? They want to be called a Christian but not live like one. Judges 21-25 explains it very thoroughly. There was no king in Israel. That's another illustration of our relationship with God, by the way. And all kings are a husband. Every man did that was what? Right in their own eyes. Right in their own eyes. When, when you hear somebody say, well, I believe. Well, my faith. Well, I believe. Okay, you got to immediately find out if their faith and their belief is what God told us to believe. Because loving God is the top commandment. And we are to believe and have faith in what he said is truth and right. Yes. Could that be an amen? amen. Yes. Hallelujah. Now, a Bible marriage requires precise guidelines. <clears throat> responsible behavior and thirdly right principles to be successful the Bible's description of a marriage has requirements and so if that is true and the marriage is a parable of the illustration of the relationship between Christ and his church then so must Christians with their marriage to God amen just makes sense not the second commandment how we treat God is more important than how we treat the poor, the addict, the homeless. How we treat God is the major commandment, the first in rank. Now, God gives precise guidelines for marriage, like one man, one woman for life. That's precise. That's very specific. There's no variation. One man, one woman for life. Can I hear an amen? See, All right. We are to serve one God for life. Isn't that true? Amen. Jesus Christ. We don't change. You know, we, we don't change our relationship with God because we go from a assembly of God to a Baptist or a Baptist or whatever. It's got nothing to do with anything except you know, we're going with a group with specific articles of faith. You got to watch those specific articles of faith that doesn't line up with Bible articles of faith. Anyway, responsible behavior. Responsible behavior is God requires that you have sex with no, you get intimate with no one else but your spouse. Okay? Thirdly, right principles. And so we get intimate with no one else but Jesus Christ. All right? No cult, no witchcraft. 
No fetishes, no nothing. No good luck charms. No idols. No charms. Just Jesus. Right. right principles. No violence. Verbal or physical. You do not treat your spouse verbally. You don't attack them verbally or physically. Right. All right. That's a right principle. See, this is where the second commandment comes in. Love your neighbors yourself. If you don't like to be chewed out and cursed out, if you don't like to be hit and lied to, then stop lying and stop hitting and stop cursing. Amen. Could that be an amen? Amen. See, this is where the second commandment comes in. Treat people like God says you should treat people and treat yourself. Secondly, you got to get a job. You got to work. You got to provide food, clothing, shelter, medical, education. You see. You got to have a budget to do that. You got to get your budget in order. When you get married, you got to put the family first. A new car may be out of your reach for years. I know young couples that buy a car that's half of a house payment. They could have bought a house. Jeez. You be sh and by the way, you should, first thing you need to do is start saving and get a house. <laughs> that is your future. That is your security in this nation. All right? <clears throat> Either that or they got pets that they can't afford. You know, they're in love with horses. <laughs> they're in love with dogs, in love with fish, I don't know, whatever it is. And they feed them and they doctor them and they can't afford to live but in a little one-room bedroom apartment with four kids because they, they love entertainment and they love uh, recreation and sports and they spend all this money doing all this stuff. And they got to raise kids. And they got to raise kids in moral right. So they got to be an example of that. And so folks, so it is in the marriage between us and Christ. Now, I submit to you that this week, the Catholic Pope said this statement. The church should apologize to the homosexual community. I, my eyes roll back in my head. My Bible tells me to evangelize the homosexual community. Not apologize. I have led over 50 homosexuals to Christ. Repenting from their sins and turning to right. Very difficult now. Most of this was done like 20 years ago. Very difficult to talk to homosexuals. Not because everybody believes God made them that way. Okay. And when we apologize to the homosexual community, instead of evangelizing them, we are destining them to hell and the lake of fire. A death that you shouldn't want anybody to die in. And I submit this to you. Since 1950, according to the United States Conference of Catholic Bishops, since 1950, 17,651 Catholic children and young people have been sexually molested and abused by 4,220 Catholic priests that we know of. They got caught. 4,220. I would like to ask Pope Francis, are you going to apologize to these guys? Or are you going to apologize to the families and the young lives that you, they corrupted? Are you with me? Amen. And you didn't deal with them. I go, what's going on? I'm using this because this is where the church is. The church is thinking, thinking with a secular mind instead of a Bible mind is what I'm trying to get through to you. Yeah, that's right. Amen. <clears throat> the teachers union. Last week. It's in the newspaper. They have set out money and get an advertisement to promote 
the homosexual community as a legal <coughs> community. And they're going to criminalize the Bible and Christians because they want to shut them up. And the teachers' unions are doing this. And they're bragging about it. Okay? Church, we got a nation that we got to reach. We can't get enclosed. No church in America can be enclosed and just be satisfied with touching God on Sundays and, and teaching children or whatever. We got to get this prophetic word out to the nations as Paul said it should be done. The school teachers have sexually molested and abused students. 10%, that is 5 million students a year, are sexually abused by public school teachers or staff. 5 million. That's an atrocity. And we weep over 40 or 50 people getting killed by a terrorist. And we're letting our young, innocent children be molested. And there's no outcry. Are you there? Amen. I agree. Do we apologize to pedophiles, to thieves, to drunks, to addicts, to sexually immoral people who commit adultery? We apologize to them. Oh, well, we didn't treat you right when you came to church. We, we preached and got you under guilt and, and made you feel bad. We're sorry. We, we made you feel bad. Are you there? Amen. We're not to apologize. We're to evangelize. Gangs and prostitutes and murderers. You know, terrorists are nothing but murderers. They can use the word terrorism all they want. These people are just flat out premeditated murderers. They plan on killing whoever they don't like. They don't care who gets in the way. They are murderers. But America can't handle normal murderers. So we can't handle international murderers either. We don't want anybody to be hung or electrocuted or, or, or put to death. My goodness, that's inhumane. But it's okay to cut off people's heads and burn them in a cage and uh, uh, sell their females into sexual slavery. Oh, yeah, well, you know, we, you know we're, we're, we're Americans. We, we're not like that. We don't talk bad about people. Well, they're bad. Amen? Do you know how many terror attacks there was in 2015? Anybody want to guess? This has blew my mind. You can read it? Okay. 14,806. That is 41 per day. And Obama says we're containing them? Is that containment to you? Remember, this gospel is supposed to go to who? All nations, all people. Folks, we got to talk about things. We can't say, well, we're the church. We, we don't get involved. We are to give the prophetic scriptures, the, the scriptures of right and wrong to the world. Amen? Amen? I submit to you, we need to evangelize. The church does, and the government needs to criminalize these kind of behaviors. They need to deal with them. Can I hear an amen? amen? Isn't that what the Bible says that government's supposed to do? Isn't it? Yes. Romans 13? Absolutely. Now, I submit to you we're not to apologize. We're to evangelize. When's the last time you told a homosexual, sir? I mean, I, just a month ago. I said, talking to one. I said, sir, how do you justify your lifestyle with the scriptures? The scripture says you can't do that. <laughs> When's the last time you confronted a homosexual with the word of God and got spit on and attacked and everybody around you, oh, that's not Christian. We got to love him. I am loving him. I'm telling him the gospel truth. Romans 2.23. The name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles through you. Now, that's a pretty direct statement, isn't it? Who's you? 
Who's he talking to? People of faith. He starts out in chapter 1. He starts out by addressing this book to the people of faith. He says, your faith is spoken of throughout the whole world. The people of faith is doing things that the Gentiles are speaking evil of God for. Remember back there we read that if the marriage relationship isn't right, people will speak evil of the word of God? He goes on to say, you know, you want everybody to be circumcised is what he said. And yet, do you commit adultery? You want people to do this and yet you do that? He says, you dishonor God through breaking the law. You, you, you got the laws you want to keep. And then you got laws that you don't want to keep. But you put down the person that don't keep the laws you want to keep. But you don't examine yourself in the laws that you're supposed to keep. And so you what? Cause God to be evil spoken of. How many know that's not loving God? With all your heart, all your soul, and with all your mind. Amen? See, I submit to you we got to get back to the first commandment. We need to be measured by the first commandment. To love God with all of our heart, with all of our soul, and with all of our mind. And remember, Jesus is able to establish you to permanently get you in a direction of right and truth. You may not be perfect today, but you can be headed toward it. And isn't that the Bible? Amen. You don't quit. You don't quit because you make mistakes today and you, you don't believe right today. You keep following because he is establishing you, permanently directing you toward truth and right. Doesn't deviate. <clears throat> Successful Christianity is not just being forgiven for my sins or being saved from hell as the parable in Isaiah 4, 1. But it's being a light to a dark world. It's evangelizing a dark world. Not apologizing to a dark world. Secularists and many Christians want to confine the Bible and Christianity to the walls of the church. The four walls. They just want us to stay in our walls. <clears throat> but the gospel, Paul said, was to go to all nations. We cannot stay in our little group, in our four walls. We got to get the message out. And yes, they won't like us. Yes, they'll mistreat us. But that is a witness to them. Didn't the, doesn't the Bible say that before the end comes, the gospel shall be preached as a witness to all nations? Doesn't it say that? Yeah. Okay, one of it is signs and wonders following, but we taught you not long ago the sign and wonders comes through preaching the gospel. Right and wrong. Repent from sin. Amen? I submit to you do it today as a person. We need to try we need to submit and choose to serve God by loving him and making him the major not the minor the first commandment not the second. Hallelujah. And this gospel of the kingdom must go to how many people? All people. You cannot get in close. We got to tell the sinner he's a sinner. And there's an answer to sin. And that's Jesus Christ. And if they reject him, that's fine. They may reject you, that's fine. But that is the message. The first commandment is what? Love God. How do we love him? All our heart. All our soul. And all of our understanding, we got to get understanding to know how to love him. 